Hello, I'm Walter Schwabe, executive producer of FuseLogic TV and the host of our brand new show, Gov2. Welcome today. We have uh, just been doing a little bit of warm up. We've been getting our guests, our online guests lined up. Uh, today, we've got a very exciting first show for you. It's action packed. We've got a ton of information and I guarantee you 30 minutes is going to go by in a flash. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about citizen engagement. How does government get more citizens engaged wherever they are around the world. And for that perspective, we're going to be talking with uh, Alex Howard, who is the Digifile online on Twitter, in fact. And he's a correspondent writing for O'Reilly Media. We've also got Lynn Doe, who is a communications for OurSay.org. And Lynn's going to talk about citizen engagement as it relates to their website and what they're doing in Australia. She's Skyping in today out of New York at the United Nations. Um, later in the show, we're going to talk about uh, the, another contributor on the show coming up in future episodes, John F. Moore. He's got a website he's launched recently called GovInTheLab.com. We're going to go there. We're going to check out that site quickly and uh, let you know all about that. Um, it's a fantastic uh, effort being put out there by John. We're also going to cover off uh, a couple of other projects that are uh, kind of really cool and special. Cook County, Illinois just uh, made an announcement about open data. We're going to review that. I'm going to talk a little bit about also what's happening here in my home province of Alberta here in Canada um, and actually what should be happening here in my home province in Alberta uh, regarding open government framework development. We're going to allude to the stuff that's going on in the province just to the west of us, and that's the province of B.C. Uh, they actually have a Minister of Citizen Services and Open Government. Kudos to those guys. We are going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I want to give you just a quick, we're going to take a quick break here. We're going to run a video put out by O'Reilly Media called What is Gov 2.0? When we come back, we're going to have Alex Howard Lindo, and we're going to start talking more open government. We'll be right back. Gov2.0 means to me new ways of doing business in government, using the tools of social networks and all the behaviors that come along with them. I think the heart of having government get to the next level of efficiency is going to be what we do with the information assets we already have today. How does government figure out how to make tougher choices? They're used to doing everything and trying to do more and more and what I really want them to do is learn how to do the right things. Education and empowerment means communication of, of what our government is doing uh, to all of the individuals in our country, not just the people who are connected to the internet and and on the social networking sites. Uh, government needs to talk to each other. So if you're in federal government, state, local, or even international, we're dealing with the same problems. There's no reason we should not be sharing the information and collaborating together. There's this commenting culture and being able to like being able to select and curate and talk. And I don't have that with the government. Open up the data, open up your systems, create APIs, and let people innovate on their own as citizens. Web 2.0, um, like government 2.0, would mean government listens to people. There's technologies that enable governments to listen to people quickly and be able to react to people's needs quickly. Government 2.0 can bring in the people that really know about the technology. It can bring in the key people from government. And it can bring in a larger group of people, particularly youth, who really understand what next generation technology has to offer democracy. Uh, so Government 2.0 for me is about innovation. It's about efficiency of government. And most of all, it's about democracy. Welcome back. Now I'm back and I'm going to be joined here now with Alex Howard uh, with the Digifile. That's his Twitter account, but it's also, I think, the, a fitting segment that we should have here on Gov2. Alex, how are you doing? I am well. Glad to be talking to you here. Thanks for being on the show, Alex, and contributing. Also on the show, you'll be able to see on the screen, we have Lynn Doe. Lynn, out of Australia, um, is a communications uh, director for OurSay.org. Hello, Lynn. Hi, guys. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. And so now, Alex, let's start with you. Um, you work for O'Reilly Media. You're the Gov 2.0 correspondent for O'Reilly. And you travel the world covering open government, Gov 2 events, all the things that are happening uh, day to day. Um, now, tell us, uh, we've got GovFresh.com. Tell us your role with uh, what you do there and, and some of the information that people can expect to find at GovFresh.com. 
Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'll do credit to Luke Fretwell, who was the founder of GovFresh. Uh, it actually had a two-year anniversary for the blog. Um, Luke has been uh, featuring, uh, I, I think, as he puts it, a more open-air approach to government now for uh, all of those years. He has put, um, I think, a focus on a number of different important areas to government, uh, including increased use of uh, new media, uh, including open source, um, and uh, in general, um, the sorts of improved constituent to government and constituent constituent communications that people associate um, with some of the Gov2 movement. Um, Luke and I talked last year about how I could be more involved there. And what we actually did is set up a new blog, um, you know, uh, called the o Open Gov Fresh, um, and that's at gov20.govfresh.com. So it's actually a subdomain, and that's something Luke's been doing a lot more of. He's created many subdomains for uh, different organizations or initiatives. Uh, this this particular month, it's a, he's very excited because they're actually hosting um, the uh, San Francisco San Francisco mayor's debate, um, uh, talking about with the different candidates about what their open government platforms might be. Right on, that's fantastic. So, and you, I would assume that you do. Uh, how often would you say you, you post blog posts at uh, that particular site? Um, you know, I, I think I post to GovFresh. Uh, depends upon the week. I. Uh, I'd say anywhere between uh, five to ten times in a given week. Wow. Um, you know, I also uh, post, of course, to the O'Reilly Radar. Right. Um, that's my home base. Right. And uh, while it's great that GovFresh is getting the attention, um, that is where uh, my work is aggregated, and I do put my more serious pieces there, and that's radar.oreilly.com uh, slash Alex H. Um, you know, I just put up a, a fairly significant feature in the White House's uh, strategy for trusted entities online, this week, and uh, there's a number of other things will be going up there, too, over the course of uh, the rest of the week. Actually, I'd like to talk about that. We had that scheduled. As you can see on the screen, we've got, uh, the, you've got the website up and ready to go. Let's talk a little bit about that Identities Project. Uh, can you give uh, our listeners, the audience uh, viewing right now, a quick overview of the, the, the whole initiative? Okay. Well, the, the first thing to uh, understand is that um, the Internet, as it's grown up, uh, is a pretty fragile place in, in a lot of ways. It's no one expected to grow as fast as it did or to be as robust as it have or have maybe the disruptive effects that it's had upon the world. Um, that open architecture creates some challenges, though, and as more and more commerce moves online uh, and as more and more uh, governments try to think about how they can engage with citizens there, it creates some um, new kinds of issues around identity and, and also around how people can securely identify themselves in different sites and different contexts. So when this administration came into office, they recognized this challenge and, and they decided to um, try to create a strategy, a national strategy, uh, for the best way to go forward in, in terms of thinking about online identity. And uh, they opened up an open government consultation with the country. And uh, in maybe, I don't want to say it's rare, but in a, a notable example, uh, they actually heard from a lot of different stakeholders and listen to them in terms of some of the ways they're approached it. And what's come out of it is this uh, thing that's a short, short handle is NSTIC, that's the acronym. But what it really is is, is uh, setting out a, a set of principles um, for creating an online identity uh, ecosystem, as they say. And the, the, the thinking is so not to create a single national ID, which is the strategy that India is going forward with for each citizen. Mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily to go with one particular provider, but to try, try to create a set of uh, standards and principles. Um, if you're familiar with government privacy, you've heard of FIPS, uh, Fair Information Practices, um, that would apply to transactions online. And then to try to encourage all the different identity providers that are out there to abide by them. Right. And we'll see whether the strategy works out. We're going to start to see some of the pilots next year. Um, the standards are going to be set by the National Institutes for Standards and Technology. And there's going to be an office house in the Department of Commerce, probably going to be um, at least talking with the, the new uh, privacy entity that's housed there as well. And uh, we'll see how it goes forward. The, the, the basic consensus, though, here is, is that this is really hard. Government really needs to figure out how to do this better. Um, businesses really know, need to know how to have trusted transactions. Um, and that the problems associated with it are, ver are, are significant. You know, right? I mean, the, the idea of um, just a password anymore right. has profound issues with it, as we're seeing for all the different data breaches. 
And this is government's uh, strategy for trying to make some of this, well, improve, frankly. Well, um, you know what? I think you're exactly right. There definitely needs to be a new system in place. I actually kind of like the idea of the fact that they're going to be going with a set of standards. I think it allows for some sort of uh, flexibility and creativity in the sense of, of, of probably coming up with the, the strongest, hopefully, the strongest overall secure solution that can be found out there. There's a lot of creative people, a lot of very smart people in the security space that could probably sink their teeth into these set of standards and produce something very, very credible, very secure, obviously, and something that uh, will lead the way, I think. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's cool that you were able to cover it, and uh, thank you for that overview. Um, sure. So one of the things that uh, this show is designed to do, in fact, is is help with a bit of the nomenclature, if you will, a bit of the, the, the language around what Government 2.0 uh, is, what open government is, the difference, uh, helping everyday citizens and also government employees around the world understand this space better. Now, one of the things that I wanted to quickly highlight was uh, an article that I found on techpresident.com, and it's uh, an article written by Nancy Scola, but it's uh, it's highlighting stuff that Beth, uh, Beth Novak uh, was saying about the, 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 the work uh, that she was doing at the White House. Um, Alex, do you know Beth Novak? I do. I, I know her well. I've interviewed her several times. You can find uh, my pieces uh, on YouTube, on Radar, on GovFresh, on uh, Huffington Post. Um, Beth and I know each other reasonably well. Um, yeah. As someone who's been covering open government closely, it would be hard for us not to. Well, you know, yeah, th that's right, exactly. I mean, especially with her role at the, at the White House as, as it was. You know, one of the things that this particular article showcases is the fact that she's actually criticizing the usage of the, the terms uh, in some ways, I guess, maybe criticizing is too harsh of a word. But she's highlighting the fact that using these new terminologies, Gov 2.0 and, and open government, kind of sends a, a message that uh, it takes us away from from really where government maybe is at the moment, or maybe it raises expectations in a direction that, that maybe we shouldn't be going as a space. So what I'd like to do is put this to you guys. Um, Lynn, we'll start with you. Um, sure. Do you think that all of this new verbiage regarding Gov 2.0 and uh, open government and, and things like that, does it, does it set a stage for something different to confuse people? Do you think it's confusing people? Um, well, to be honest, I don't think most people know these terms, Gov 2.0, Open Gov or anything like that. So the project I'm working on back in Australia, um, I'll say Australia, definitely works on, you know, engaging citizens and things like that with politicians through using different forms of technology and, you know, what we're calling Web 2.0, Open Gov and things like that. But that's none of the messaging that we sort of, like, tell our users... We don't tell them that the website that they're on is about opening up governments or making things more transparent. For them, they just see it as the tool. So we don't even bother using that terminology with them just because I think it would actually create that confusion. But I guess you sort of need that within an industry, but not necessarily when you're speaking to whoever it is your consumers are. Right. Yeah, I guess, I, you know, I, I agree. And I like the fact that you're not even sort of highlighting that space. It's almost like... This is a, a set of uh, language and definitions for people that maybe are already advocates. But it's, it's, I'm finding it difficult, and maybe, Alex, you can weigh in here as well. I'm finding it difficult sometimes. Like, we always have to explain what it is that we're trying to suggest, when ultimately I think there's all sorts of, of, of subsets to this. But ultimately what we're talking about is, is government in, uh, being in more easy, uh, uh, easily approachable by citizens, more collaboration, more engagement, uh, more efficiencies, uh, things of that nature. Alex, what are you finding it, as you go through your, your life? Are, are people sort of struggling with the nomenclature? Well, sure. Uh, but that, that's true almost any time you end up in D.C. because of the uh, alphabet soup here, the gobbledygook, all the different names for things. Uh, it's easy to get lost in that. And, you know, I, I, I can't help but be closely branded with the term, so I think about this stuff. Uh, I mean, I, frankly, open government's not a new thing. Right, that, that, and there's there are really closely associated um, ideas that, that go with it, um, and they have been for decades. This, so this isn't something that I think we should suddenly think of as new. Um, you know, uh, people generally associate transparency with it. Uh, they generally associate a different way of government doing business, uh, and that's not something I think should go away uh, in terms of our understanding of the term. Um, 
you know, I, I do spend a lot of time reading encyclopedias and dictionaries. That's part of uh, my academic training. Uh, I even wrote for one for a while at whatis.com. So I'm, I'm attached to uh, this idea that words have meaning and that we should understand what that is and then stick by them, especially when we're thinking about how to measure things and how to have a common set of um, principles, a common set of standards, common set of um, things so that we can really talk uh, constructively. Um, you know, the, the reality here is that uh, it's a community-defined convention. So there's going to be as many definitions for it as there are people in many ways. Um, I think people can um, understand now in 2011 that e-government um, is something that's going to be baked into government. Um, the, the newer versions, as they were, are a little trickier. Uh, There's something that Beth wrote about uh, at the end of her piece on the Huffington Post, which I thought was uh, really useful, is that eventually the terms are going to go away. We're not going to do Gov 2.0. We're not going to go Gov 3.0. We're not going to talk about we government, um, which is tech president's thoughtful way of putting out this, uh, this idea of us all working collaboratively. We're not going to do any or I government if that was what you know, comes up. It's just going to go back to being government because that'll be the way business is being done. Right. Uh, the, the reason that there, I think there is interest in Gov 2 and has been um, is, is twofold. One is because the idea of Web 2.0 has obviously been popularized and was important and continues to be in some ways. And obviously, I work for the company where the pe people actually coined the term. And it, it brought a rethinking of the way that the web was working or could work, um, specifically around platform principles, specifically around thinking of um, the web as a place you could write to, around something um, where uh, people created things that allowed other people to create. Yes. Um, around where when you release data, um, generative activity occurs from it, right? Then that, that's something that's very important in thinking how the Internet has changed over the last seven or eight years. Well, and how it Alex, let me, to. let me just jump yeah. in there quickly. Let me interrupt yeah. you. Let's get Lynn in yeah. here because you just said something really important sure. that I thought was cool. And, and you're talking about when data gets released, then that yes. generates some sort of activity. Lynn, are, are you guys at OurSay.org in Australia, are you working with any public data to get the work done that you do on that particular site? Well, at the moment, we're not actually working with any, like, public data organization or any group that's, you know, working to expose or, like, better organized data so that people can sort of access that more easily. I guess for us, all of the content that is on our site is actually generated by the users. All we simply are is an independent platform right. um, where people can come and post their questions to the government government in the way that, as Alex was saying, uh, is like traditional. So instead of writing a letter, you can come onto our say and post your question there. And rather than that letter just coming from you, you can la like, leverage the support with your own community, get other people to support your question by voting on it, um, which is the terminology that we use at our say, and then demonstrating to whoever it is that is your local official that there's more than one person that cares about this issue. Um, so I guess in many ways, I guess at some point, once we're a bit more developed, we're currently sort of still in a pilot phase. Right. Our say will actually become a portal of data because what we're a data for is current day issues that citizens care about and like which particular groups of um, the society cares about that, so which demographics and things. In many ways, it's almost like we're a polling service, but not quite because we're not asking the questions or setting the agendas. We're letting people do that. We're just sort of collecting all the data um, and information about things that people would have traditionally contacted their government about that might have actually uh, remained like, as correspondent between them and their official as opposed to something that was open on the web for everyone else to say. Lynn, what's the response been from the elected official side, from the bureaucracy side with respect to your site? Maybe Evan can pull the site up as we talk about this and you answer that question, but what's been their response to this site overall? Sure. Well, we've sort of only actually been live and active as a website for the past six months and like you factor in sort of the holiday break over Christmas and things like that. We've run two events and we actually have an event up now, so that's probably what you guys are seeing on screen. Um, so obviously during our first event with any sort of Gov 2.0 as the terminology we've been using initiative has come up, politicians are a bit hesitant because they don't necessarily all understand A, what the online space is and B, even though this is part of their job, they've not necessarily always understood who their constituents are either. So once you combine the two, that I guess raises a whole lot of barriers in us accessing them to get them onto the site because for them they view things in terms of risk management and with a site like our say given that it's a new platform uh we aim to engage with people that have never engaged with politics before it's a lot of risks 
for them dealing with a completely uncertain audience. But at the same time, they've been really receptive and open to the idea of embracing these new technologies in order to engage with the constituents that I have previously been unable to. So I guess listening to the voices of the minority, really, yeah. but through a different medium, which in many ways is also far more cost effective for them. Um, it's a lot easier for a politician to do outreach and things like that online as opposed to going around to every single shopping mall within their constituency to visit 40,000 people. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, interestingly enough, one of the things that we did here is our own sort of mini case study with respect to citizen engagement at a municipal level. Uh, we launched a, a, a series of three websites called Future Edmonton, Future Calgary, Future Red Deer .ca. Uh, Evan might be able to bring up future Edmonton.ca while I speak about it. But it's it's along the same sort of track of thinking as OurSay.org. It's not identical, but it does actually allow for, in this case, municipal residents of a given city to start posting ideas or thoughts or concerns that are important to them in their life in their, in their particular city or town. And um, it's a very simple WordPress uh, sort of uh, platform here. And all we wanted to do was just allow people to start very specifically posting their thoughts, ideas, concerns, and then allowing others to vote on them up or down, making them more important than others. So I think it's kind of similar in the sense that uh, OurSay.org has got that voting mechanism all driven by <laughs> citizens, which is very cool too. So um, yeah, that's kind of neat. Um, Alex, what to, in terms of uh, a site that's maybe similar to this kind of thread of thinking, is there another site you'd like to highlight before we move on? Um, you know, I, I, there's a, a, a broader, I think, sweep of, of different um, uh, software packages that are, that are trying to do this, uh, whether it's uh, ideation, whether uh, people mm -hmm. are thinking through um, some of the semantic web tools that are cropping up. Right. Um, certainly the, the U.S. government has contracted with different firms to try to help them do this. Uh, I don't think anyone's figured out the magic bullet yet. Um, often it's some com combination of technologies and tools. Uh, right. You know, uh, Microsoft's been trying to uh, put forward its uh, town hall platform. Uh, Google's been playing in this space. Um, I think you'll probably see some offerings from some other enterprise enterprise players as well. Um, some really interesting stuff happening um, in the back end. And sorry, we've got a. Going over <laughs> no, that's now. okay. I like, you yeah, know what, I like see. Microsoft's Town Hall offering. Uh, I've seen that too. I think it's a it's a yeah. great initiative. And I think you're right, Alex. There, there are a number of different uh, organizations, big and small, yeah. uh, looking to figure out this whole uh, this whole space. I want to move on oh. now. Um, oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to add something really, really sort sure. of important to that with, like, I guess, what Alex was saying about this being a space where everyone's still sort of playing with multiple technologies. And one of the things that sort of makes our say that bit different in terms of how we're approaching it is that we're not just working with technology, we're actually working with people at the end of the day as well. So we actually do a lot of offline outreach and I guess what you would call traditional community organising as well, because at the end of the day, no online tool will be that effective in actually linking politicians and citizens together unless there is that offline component as well. But, oh, yeah, yeah you've, got to have, you've got to have the offline engagement where people can come together, uh, you know, and, and from time to time, you know, on that basis, some of the things that I've personally been involved with myself, uh, you know, there's been some some open city workshops with our local uh, municipality, uh, the city of Edmonton here. Uh, there's also been, uh, you know, gov camps with Microsoft driving that around the world. There's been, um, you know, uh, all sorts of different sort of events. I was mentioning earlier, actually, Open Gov West, which is which is uh, is driven by one particular organization, uh, organizations, uh, Sarah Schacht, and uh, Knowledge is Power. But but there are lots of different opportunities for us to get together, start talking about what's important, and I think that there's always room for more. So Lynn, I agree with you 110 percent on that. I want to go now quickly to GovInTheLab.com. We've got another contributor that'll be on uh, live next week uh, with us, and John F. Moore, who's uh, just outside of Boston in Winthrop, uh, Massachusetts. And he's launched a, a website here uh, called GovInTheLab.com. And uh, Evan, if you can bring that up for us, uh, we'll, we'll let the, the folks have a look at that. Uh, Govern the Lab is a great initiative. It's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of information that is being put out on this website across the entire space. I mean, it's amazing the kind of content that and volume of content that's being pushed out here. And so it's going to be exciting to, uh, to have John on the show as well to contribute. Um, 
but uh, there, there really is a lot of uh, a depth of knowledge here. Now, of course, there's lots of great sources. We've talked about O'Reilly already, and we've talked about uh, a couple of other sources in terms of just general information. But I love what John's doing here. It's going to be fantastic uh, uh, to go through some of the content on future shows as things develop. Because one of the other things about this show that I'd like to make sure and uh, that, that happens is that we, we stay relevant. We, we do a kind of a week in review. And Alex, that was one of your suggestions as we develop the, the platform and the format of this show as we're moving forward. So we stay relevant and uh, we stay up to date as much as we possibly can. So it's important for us to tap into as many different uh, sources from around the world. Uh, and speaking about that, actually, last night uh, I was on Twitter. I had some time. And uh, I was uh, participating. I managed to, to be able to be on time for GovChat on Twitter. So the hashtag would be hash GovChat. And, uh, of course, John was, uh, was firing it up on there, as, as were you, Alex, and, and a few other people, of course, uh, Tom Kearney out of Ottawa and a, and a number of other people were contributing. And I found it fascinating because one of the things that I found happening while we were communicating in GovChat was that um, – May, you know, as Twitter enables and most social networking does, of course, is it enables you to form new relationships. And I want to say hello to our friends and audience from Brazil. I was able to, to uh, meet with uh, some folks online from Brazil, and I'm hoping to get uh, Brazil, um, you know, in terms of uh, these, these folks from a specific city in Brazil uh, on the show coming up in the future here. So. As a result of GovChat, it was in, we were able to make a connection, and we'll have some future episodes from down in South uh, uh, South uh, America, which is really very very cool. I love that's the thing I love about this online, uh, you know, environment. Uh, it's just so very cool to meet people with. So moving on, then uh, any any comments on Gov in the Lab, uh, Lynn? Have you been to GovInTheLab.com before? Have you seen that website? Um, not in a long time actually so probably a couple of months ago so i'm sure it's changed quite a lot since yeah John's so i don't think i'm the best person to com yeah comment alex how about you uh yeah um i i have visited there um lynn it looks the same as it did um Excellent. you know well uh i i wish john would invest a little bit of time in a, a better designer um on this one um you know yeah it, it's pretty hard to find a lot of what's being pushed through um one one thing you might ask uh john about is is how he secured permission for a lot of the content he's pushing through um you know he's not he he's aggregating like crazy yeah. um yeah, and is, yeah. There has been um, a little bit of pushback in the community about that strategy because he hasn't always secured permissions in the way that I would like as a writer and then has pushed it through without a backlink. Okay. Um, and that's not how I how would want to do it. Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. You know what, Alex? I mean, next week, let's have you. Let's have John on. Let's, uh, let's throw on the gloves. Let's come out, uh, you know, in the first round. No, I'm just kidding. Let's... But let's talk about that. That'll be a great question to have with John next week, and let's talk more about the, the structure of that. It's great feedback, and I think, you know what, interestingly enough, when, when you're conducting business online, you have to be as transparent as you possibly can, and if you're, you know, you're, you're doing things that maybe other folks are finding that we need to polish up on or change or something, I think we need to be open and receptive to that kind of uh, constructive criticism or criticism, if you will. So I think that's a great point, Alex, and I think we should mm -hmm. bring that up and, and move it forward and see what John John has in, in terms of a response uh, so, to it. But I yeah. still think it's terrific to have him on the show and be a part of the show overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, for, for me, um, so he's been uh, running a lot of um, posts from Code for America and the Sunlight Foundation, right. uh, both of whom uh, operate great blogs, yeah. and um, has been promoting the heck out of his republishing of that content. And frankly, I'd rather go read it where it came from, um, because then you come across all the different things those organizations are doing, as opposed to um, seeing you know ads getting sold against it. And I understand um, he's um, he's trying to make a business of this. Um, you know that that this, that is part of this space, mm -hmm. and I respect that. Um, I think for for me, I almost always want to go back and link to original sources. That's something that I've been doing for years on the web. Um, and you can expect that I'll continue to do that. To uh, do that, right? 
Yeah, well, there's yeah. something to be said about that for sure, but I'm sure also that, you know, aggregation, Alex, is not a brand new thing. It's not as if John just uh, invented that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Aggregation does happen all over the world, and I think that if we were to, but I, I, I take your point in terms of getting there's uh, a big track difference between and links posting and all of that two stuff paragraphs for sure, and yeah. posting the entire piece. Absolutely, okay? sure. Yeah, no, and I, I hear don't you. Don't need to tell me that aggregation is something new. Newspapers have been aggregating each other as long as there have been For, newspapers. Forever, exactly. <laughs> forever, <laughs> literally. Okay, right on. Well, let's move on. Uh, one of the other things that I wanted to highlight today and make sure that we gave a shout out to was Cook County, Illinois. Uh, mm. Cook County recently, uh, just uh, in late April, made an announcement about them releasing their uh, Cook County data, which I find absolutely fantastic. It's terrific, although I will say that um, I did highlight this on Twitter um, and put it out. We did get a, a bit of a response on Twitter in, in terms of a retweet, but when I tried to reach out to the organization and try to get somebody more involved uh, as a part of this show and, and, and in general, I didn't get any response back. So what I'm hoping is that Cook County will open up. It, what it says to me is that they're not quite – they're not quite comfortable with the, that wide open engagement that I think we'd like to see happen here. Um, it could be also that they're just incredibly busy and, you know, who the heck am I? Yeah. But the, frankly, though, it would be nice to see them engage just a little bit more and, and get back to us. Uh, and maybe we can have them on a future show. But kudos to Cook County for for, for sending out the, their, their open Cook County plan, if you will. And uh, Evan will bring up, if he hasn't already, the, uh, the blog that they have and... Um, uh, it shows actually a, a really neat presentation about what they have as far as a strategic vision goes for this. And so you can actually download that if you want or take a look through it. There's a lot of great information there uh, put out about what they plan to do, uh, how they plan to, to do it. So it would be great to have them on the show on a future show and, um, and get a sense of, you know, because they're at this beginning stage of open data, uh, releasing of that. I mean, here at the city of Edmonton, uh, they released the data. It's good. Well, man, what's the exact anniversary? I don't know. It's, it's getting up to about a year or so. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it, they've been underway for a while. And of course, other cities here in Canada, the city of Ottawa, city of Vancouver, um, you know, there have been uh, a number of cities here in, in this country releasing data. So it's good to see more and more uh, jurisdictions releasing data. Um, now what I want to do is I want to take a quick break. I want to, uh, we're going to play a video for you that we shot with the Chief Information Officer of the City of Edmonton, Chris Moore. We did this last year with him. It's a three-part series, but we're just going to play the first part. It's a couple of minutes. So have a listen to what Chris says about uh, open data and, the, and the, so a bit of the process that, that he and the rest of the IT branch at the City of Edmonton, the communications group, uh, in fact, council, all of that evolution, he's got a, a few key points he makes during this uh, this uh, video. And when we come back, we'll come back with Alex and uh, Lean, and we'll begin to wrap up the show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Chris Moore. I'm the Chief Information Officer at the City of Edmonton. I've been at the City of Edmonton since October 2008. The uh, three big things that, um, that we're thinking about in terms of open data at the City of Edmonton. First is really uh, collaboration and it's broadening the circle. Uh, so it's, it's including people in the conversation uh, because when we include more people in the conversation then we get an outcome that, uh, that's like the collective creative and just a few people sitting in a room. That's the, the first big thing. The, the second big thing is that it's possible for government to show up to people in a different way, to be that collaborative way. And the third thing is, is really just to introduce the, the concept in Edmonton or in the greater Edmonton area that there's more than just the city of Edmonton involved in this ecosystem. There's other levels of government, other organizations, school boards, universities, colleges, even private sector. So for people who are thinking, are asking themselves, this sounds really exciting, this sounds great, how can I help? So whether you're in an individual or whether you're in an organization, public sector, private sector, I think the thing to think about is that are uh, the possibilities. Um, you know, what's possible when it comes to uh, interacting with government? Is it possible that uh, Edmonton is sincerely wanting to be collaborative and share information and engage people uh, further and deeper in the discussion. So really what we need people to do is just to ask themselves, you know, 
one of the possibilities when it comes to open data or open government. Welcome back. You know, I think you found probably as you watch that video, uh, Chris Moore's really kind of relaxed and comfortable persona. And I, you know, it's it's been fantastic to work with Chris on various projects over the last uh, the last while, uh, year and a bit. And uh, Chris has really done a tremendous job with the IT branch and uh, also working together collaboratively with communications and and lots of people at the city of Edmonton. So it's, uh, but I guess I think you can get a sense of that. Um, I've got a question now for our online guests, uh, for Alex and Lynn, uh, from the chat room. Uh, Mac asks, uh, how evolved is tracking um, is the tracking methodology related to Gov2? In other words, is government learning uh, anything from those who are using it or doing something different out there? So in other words, what kind of outcomes are we seeing? And, and Lynn, I'll start with you in Australia. Uh, what kind of outcomes are you seeing in government down there? Sure. Um, so I guess I'll use a like specific as a say example that happened recently with one of the events that we ran. So um, how the platform works for those that haven't checked it out online is that you log in, you ask the question and you leverage support off that. And then the top three, top five or top whatever questions are answered. Um, so one of the top questions that we recently had was should caffeinated drinks have a legal drinking age, uh, which was, you know, something that isn't traditionally seen as being an issue. It's not a climate change poverty related thing. Uh, but from that, both of the politicians that sort of had to respond to that question, even though they didn't necessarily give a definitive answer, both of them went away and did their own separate research within their offices and sort of have since incorporated elements of what they learned about the caffeinated drinks issue into uh, some of their policy that they put out on, like, health issues and the like. So that's sort of more the outcomes that we've been seeing is that politicians actually understanding that when they do and say things online it makes them that bit more accountable because so many more people are aware of what they're actually either committing to or supporting or like not voicing their support for and they've incorporated this back into their policy work as opposed to just sort of traditional uh, constituency outreach which is often just a I'm here to get your feedback but I might not take it as opposed to when they've been asked a question directly they've sort of had to respond and come up with something that they can actually Actually go back to their constituents right. with like an action they've committed. Yeah. Terrific. Alex, how about you? What kind of, I know there's, uh, I mean, I probably the answer to this is there's so many different examples to highlight, but what's one that comes to mind in terms of uh, outcomes? Well, the, there's a number of them. I think the, the one that I like to talk about, because I think it's a really interesting example that people don't know that much about, is something called the Direct Project. Are you, are you familiar with that? The Direct Project? Mm -hmm. No. Um, so this, what it actually is, is effectively a secure standard for transmitting health-related information over the Internet. Ah. Um, and the reason that's interesting is because um, government worked collaboratively to create the standard. They brought in one of the preeminent um, open-source technologists of our time, a fellow named Brian Bellendorf, who is part of the Apache community. And, of course, Apache is the web server that powers so much of the online world. Yep. and um, collaborated around the creation of this secure standard for transmitting information. And it basically grew out of uh, concern that um, physicians had expressed to people in government that they couldn't simply email information from one clinic to a hospital or vice versa, um, which is a real issue in the uh, electronic age. And over the course of a uh, real open government process, they were able to create this standard. And as a result... Um, that's now being rolled out all around the country, and that's going to then extend as a standard to the rest of the world. And the web address, um, Alex, that people can check I it out? I think that's uh, the directproject.org. .org, right. That's right. Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, it used to be known as NHIN Direct. Um, you can go to the O'Reilly Radar and read some terrific posts by Brian Ahir upon it. Um, it has been colloquially called the Health Internet. Uh, that's not a bad way to describe it for the layperson. <laughs> Um, it's basically a way of transmitting your health data or health information securely from one point to another. Didn't used to be able to do that. And me, that is something which is going to directly result in people being able to get better health care faster um, and also not 
you know, uh, a minor point, going to create some economic activity too. Alex, let me ask you a couple of quick questions because the timing of this this uh, this story is incredible. Um, let me ask you, what do you think the, the the amount of money invested in the direct project is right now? Just an estimate, rough estimate. Um, I don't know. Actually, okay. uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to measure um, that kind of um, investment because of the uh, it, it's happening in, in a lot of different yeah. startups. Right. Um, I think that the if you're looking at the amount of investment it took to create it, um, that's a different question. And it's very, very low. We're talking about the creation of a standard in an open source consultation. Right. Right. Um, Okay, well, you, 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 I mean, you hit my point there. The, the point, the reason why I asked you that question, uh, Alex, uh, because just yesterday, our local provincial government just made an announcement about a brand new website that they've launched called myhealth.alberta.ca. And uh, myhealth.alberta.ca is about, is a, is a, what I've been told or what we've been told here in Alberta is a three step process, a three phase process. Now, uh, back in 2002, I was working on a project related to um, electronic medical health records, and uh, I was working on the software side for a client on the consulting basis, and uh, they, they were producing software for, for uh, general practitioners or GPs in their offices to work with this information, this uh, the health information and health records. And it was supposed to tie into a project called uh, Alberta WellNet, uh, and Alberta WellNet was, of course, the provincial system by which your personal health record would be integrated so that you could go to any hospital, uh, any doctor's office in the province, and have, uh, at that point in time, your prescriptions, your, uh, you know, your most recent lab work, that kind of thing, anything you were allergic to. Uh, because in, in Canada, every year, and this number may have changed since I've last looked at it, but it's enough, uh, the same amount of people as a 747 die every year in Canada because of misprescriptions uh, or misdiagnosis on that basis. So you get, you're giving uh, somebody penicillin when they're allergic to it, they die, that kind of thing. So it's incredibly important that they get this right, okay? Now, the province of Alberta just announced... This, the launching of this new website, and if you go to myhealth.alberta.ca, you'll see that it's mostly, uh, you know, the health A to Z, um, you know, uh, encyclopedia of information. The minister says over 9,000 uh, entries there in terms of bits of information on health. And then what they're looking to do is spend $33 million moving this to a place that you just described the direct project being able to do just about today. OK, and so this is what we're seeing here is that methodology of going sort of the old way, which is, you know, secure an enterprise level uh, organization to spend millions and millions of dollars on a tech project. Now, this thirty three million dollars doesn't take into effect all the money that's been spent on Alberta WellNet with IBM already. All the money that's been spent in tax dollars getting this the, the EHR EMR systems up and running to some degree here in this province. This is an additional $33 million, as I understand it. I could be wrong, but that's the way the minister uh, tabled it yesterday. So, yeah. you know, it's interesting because we still have, in, in our home province, this is my way to lead into, we absolutely mm -hmm. need here in Alberta this open government framework and, a, and a, basically a culture shift of thinking to, to look at and investigate projects like the directproject.org, uh, is it, or .com, um, we need to investigate more projects like that, and we need to take the the uh, the open government framework uh, thinking, I guess, and put it more on the forefront here in this province. Um, well, well, Walter, can yeah. I just break in for a sec? Yeah, you Let's bet. be clear. The direct project and, and what's there is a, is a standard. It's not a website. Right. right. Well, we don't have a standard here. Standards. So this is not, you're talking about a, a health portal for citizens. The direct project is a standard for the transmission of health information between points. Correct. So, so they're I understand apples that. And, they're apples and oranges here. Okay, and, all right. So and, I, I and get that, Alex, and I appreciate the, yeah. the, the difference there. But what I want to say, though, is is that um, we, you know the standards that we're talking about here in the province of Alberta are supposed to be in place so that so that somebody can build something on top of it, like yeah. what the direct project is is setting up standards for, right? So. Yep. So, yes, I understand that there's uh, – and thank you for clarifying. I understand that difference there. But what, we, what we're seeing, though, is, is all of this happening behind closed doors here in this province, okay? It's not happening out in the public, you know, sort of uh, openly and transparently. 
I, I, what I'm seeing with the direct project is this is open and wide open, and you can see it, you can see it evolve as the standards uh, start to evolve. I'm not yeah. seeing that here in my own province, okay? So mm -hmm. what I'm seeing is that my main point here is, is that transparent versus not transparent. Working and dumping millions of dollars into a project and then coming out and going, ta-da, see what we've been working on for the last however long? As opposed to something that's open and transparent, allowing people to contribute uh, from the get-go, I guess is my major point, right? So I, maybe I didn't, uh, I, I didn't get there right away, but that was ultimately my goal here. And, and also my goal for saying, look, in this province, we need to start doing more of yeah. that transparent work out in the open is really what I'm trying to say. So, a, but thank you for clarifying the two there? differences. Um, there, there is something that's important in terms of thinking through the, what the idea of, of government 2.0 is. Uh, when it comes to thinking about the, the web and, and how you're creating things, um, the 1.0 version is to create a web portal. The 2.0 version is to create web services. Now, if you want to see that in practical effect, look at how the FCC has approached this new website, full of APIs, open source, hosted in the cloud, um, lots and lots of data. People can right. build things off of it, right, 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 and and when, and that's actually reinventing how government works in a really important way. That means the SEC is dog fooding. They're using their own data to build things. They're using right. the same data anybody else would. Yeah. Um, it's the one one area actually where I really disagreed with what Beth Novak wrote in her open government versus good government. She said that 2.0 is just about using Silicon um, uh, Valley toys yeah. for technology. Right. It's not really reinventing government. That's not true. If you build things differently from that ground up in terms of open data, in terms of building as a platform, it actually does change the way the government can work with citizens and the way that citizens can build things on top of what government has created. Absolutely. Well, I mean, for example, our own firm here, we have a transit app, okay? We have a transit app, and of course, the only reason it can exist is because the city of Edmonton and other cities here in Canada have released their transit data, right? right. And yep. so we built, and as Chris Moore liked to refer to the app and, and other apps like it, you know, no tax dollars were harmed in the making of this application. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct that building those kind of services based on the release of data does actually save municipalities, state and federal, uh, provincial, you know, uh, governments dollars because it does allow things to be built. Um, and it does change the interactivity. It closes the gap. It narrows the gap between citizens and government, which I think is very, very cool. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting close. Uh, we've run over time here. We've kept Alex and we've kept Lynn longer than we originally agreed, and that's just, I think, because we were just having, I don't know, so much fun. Alex, Lynn, did you enjoy your experience today? Did you have a lot of fun? Yeah, it was good. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, love being able to call in from the backyard here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so very much, everybody, for watching the first inaugural episode of Gov2 here on FuseLogic TV. I'm Walter Schwabe. Tune in every week on Thursdays at 1.30 Mountain Standard right here, FuseLogic.tv, to see what other kind of fireworks we can create as we talk about this, these kinds of issues and these kinds of innovations and opportunities. We'll see you next week.